On behalf of the Graduate College of Education, I would like to welcome everyone today to this most happy occasion. A doctoral program is a really profound experience, and it changes people's lives in very many and different ways. We are so happy today to recognize the work that our graduates have performed in completing their program. And it is a delight to have their friends, their family, their supporters <coughs> here with us to celebrate. I would like at this point uh, to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Francis White. Dr. White has a distinguished career in leadership roles in various colleges throughout the Bay Area. Dr. White is Superintendent, President Emerita of the Marin Community College District, has served as the President of Skyline College, and was the Executive Chancellor for City College of San Francisco. In addition to these leadership roles, Dr. White has served in a multitude of mid-management and instructional positions throughout her career. We are honored and fortunate to have Dr. White as one of our doctoral faculty for the last six years. Her expertise and experience brings a wealth of information to our students. Please welcome Dr. Francis White. Thank you, Dr. Keene. And hello and welcome to everyone here today to the platform party. Colleagues, families, friends, and guests, welcome to the celebration for the doctorate, education doctorate leadership, and for specifically the graduating class of 2013. So I want to take you guys down memory lane just for a little bit, not too long, not too long. Do you remember your first class, the first semester? Was it with me and Bob? Yeah. Yeah. I kind of thought that. You probably thought then, and throughout your time even after then, that completing a doctorate was just far-fetched, big pipe dream, and how the heck am I going to pull this off, right? Mm -hmm. Well, congratulations, it was no pipe dream, here you are today. And all of your family and friends and faculty are here to celebrate you today. Your future is bright, and you're well prepared after 18 rigorous courses and a dissertation to meet educational challenges as educational leaders. I know each of you will have a dissertation story. Nobody gets a doctorate without a dissertation story. And every time you tell that story to whomever will want to listen, you'll enjoy telling the story because of what it took for you to even be able to tell the story. You're just going to be happy to let people know what it was like. And the fact that you were able to persist, you had the stamina, the fortitude, and I remember you all, you had gravitas also, because I remember your class very well, what happened in that class. You had all that going for you to get through this program. And it is going to pay off. It has paid off. We're all here today to celebrate your payoff and your accomplishment. Over the past few years, you've read, you've researched, you've discussed, you've debated, and written about teaching and learning, social justice and equity in education. These topics are etched in your thinking and ways of viewing student learning 
and success forever. Although we all know there is some improvement in test scores, or at least we get to read about that occasionally at least, we still know there are those students who fall through the cracks and are vulnerable to being shut out from obtaining a solid quality education and or even a college degree. We know that certain categories of students are more likely to succeed or fail based on socioeconomic status and the school they attend. Ultimately, we know that many schools are in crisis and educational reform at the system level may not come soon enough to save the already marginalized students. I saw a video, what do you call it, a YouTube video. It's a YouTube video. Sometimes I have time to do that. Um, recently, um, and there, it was this teacher. Her name is Miss Pearson. You may have seen it yourself. This video was about a teacher who helped students learn from failure. Miss Pearson is a very jovial, motivating, spirited woman. In the video, she says, you know why kids drop out? Kids drop out because of poverty, low attendance, and low grades. And we know all of those things do prevent academic achievement. But she goes on to say that Another prime factor in the difference between student success and failure is human connections and significant relationships with teachers. When teachers show they care, it makes all the difference because kids don't learn from teachers they don't like. In fact, kids don't learn from people they don't like, but definitely from teachers they don't like. Ms. Pearson is a teacher who every day shows care for her students. And she gave the best example about how to do that, how this relationship with students matters to help them pull themselves from the grips of failure. She gave a test, there were 20 questions, and one of her students only got two questions right. So on the paper, instead of putting a minus 18, she put a plus two and a smiley face. And the student asked her, says, well, but I flunked, I failed. You put a smiley face, I got an F, and you gave me a smiley face. She says, sure, you got to right. That's better than nothing. You're on the right track. She rewarded what was done, what was positive. She focused on the positive part of that. And she was able to encourage her student to do better next time because she had a smiley face on the test paper. Our educational system in California is in a precarious situation, and we all know this. We used to have the best public school system in the country, and we have gone from first to worst in many metrics, including the achievement gap, graduation rate for minorities, for example, the education reformers want to link test scores to teacher evaluations and merit pay. Whether any of this will ever improve test scores and prepare students for college is continually debated amongst both advocates and foes of teacher reform and education reform. What we do know is there seems to be an unwillingness in our state, at least, to move aggressively to change these matters. This situation begs the question of when, if not now, what would it take to spark our educational system to change? And how could we ever get agreement on where to start? You've already written your dissertation that was rhetorical. <laughs> These are challenges facing educators today and will continue to expand the achievement gap in student learning and success if something isn't done. 
Obviously, reform at any level is difficult. But, for example, in the California Community Colleges, the college scorecard, if you've heard about that, is here to stay. The scorecard provides data points about individual community college student success rates and completion rates. Naturally, this too has its foes and advocates. But suffice it to say, a whole new paradigm about student success and completion has been born in the California Community College system, like it or not. This tell-all ranking of community colleges is already helping some and embarrassing others to try harder and do better. Challenges will always persist in our educational system and strong leadership will be essential to tackle the problems and spark the change. Focused leadership is necessary to deal with the challenges ahead in secondary education and community colleges. Academic leadership at the administrative level and classroom levels are critical to creating equity in teaching and learning. Your degree has prepared you to be the leaders of change. Your degree has prepared you to be the spark for change. The torch is being passed on to you. And it's your time to stand and lead. Without your educational leadership, our educational system will not provide <coughs> the necessary learning and training needed in a 21st century economy. Today, we are colleagues, and you are joining our ranks as educational leaders. We must keep moving it forward, keep moving forward to close the achievement gap, ensure educational equity for all students, and define the path to social justice, student success, and a good quality of life. These challenges are dawning, and no one of us can be Mrs. Pearson. But like Mrs. Pearson, we're educators. We can do this. You can do this. Congratulations to the class of 2013, and best wishes to you all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. White. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Macheo Payne, our, two, our 2013 cohort speaker. Dr. Payne holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from the University of California, Berkeley, a Master's degree in Social Work from California State University, East Bay, and an Educational Doctorate degree from San Francisco State University. He currently serves as the Director of Training for the Lincoln Child Center in Oakland, a school-based mental health program at an Oakland Unified School District alternative middle school. During his 18 years as a skilled trainer and facilitator, Dr. Payne has worked directly with youth as the coordinator for leadership excellence and as the Oakland Youth Commission coordinator for the city of Oakland. He is the founding director of Youth Uprising Center in East Oakland and is a national trainer for the Children's Defense Fund's Child Policy Training Institute. Please welcome Dr. Michelle. Thank you, Dr. King. Dr. Gabriner, esteemed faculty, esteemed guests, family, friends, 
here today to celebrate this wonderful occasion. <laughs> Thank you to my fellow students for entrusting me with the honor of delivering the student message. In seventh grade, I was suspended from school for throwing acorns <laughs> during lunchtime. I don't remember much about the incident, but of the two dozen people who were involved, only two were suspended, myself and another student. We were both black males. The second and only other time I was suspended was for cutting class to go to the arcade. That shows you how old I am. Fast forward to senior year in high school when I was told by a counselor that I couldn't graduate. A counselor informed me that I was one class short of the requirement for graduation. So now as a social worker and as an educator, I now recognize the depression that paralyzed me after that event. I wasn't visibly sad or crying like the familiar signs of depression that we're used to in this culture. Instead, I was drunk, I was high, and I was a reckless young man. A year later, I was involved in a fight in a party in Alameda. I got arrested, and I was the only one taken into custody. I was also the only African-American male in a sea of mostly white partygoers. I never saw a connection between these events, but now I understand that this was no accident. According to research, an African-American male suspended in middle school just one time is half as likely to graduate and twice as likely to get arrested later on in life. In fact, in Oakland and San Francisco, two out of three black males will face suspension by the time they reach the 12th grade if they make it that far. My experience was not an anomaly. My experience reflects a deeply entrenched system of inequity exacerbated by racism and poverty. Through my participation in this program, my lens, our lens, for looking at complex problems, both personal and professional, is through research and inquiry. The memory of these suspensions was not something that I carried with me consciously as I walked through the halls of the comprehensive high school that I attended as I navigated all the different things in school. But in what ways do our collective school experiences influence our educational outcomes? Participation in this program has forced me and my colleagues to examine in the ways in which we are both individually and collectively impacting, as well as individually and collectively responsible for what happens in our schools. Autonomy versus agency. My research addresses disproportionate suspension of black males, as you would have guessed, particularly in middle school. Research shows that since Brown versus Board of Education, black males have increasingly been suspended at two to three times the rate of their white male counterparts. Studies show bias, not black male behavior, is the culprit. One systemic bias in the form of opportunity gaps. Those are structural inequalities, funding, testing, college admissions, and access to quality teaching, to name a few. Two, institutional bias in the form of zero tolerance policies. This is the way states and districts have gone way beyond legitimate safety measures to suspend and expel harmless behaviors such as bringing utensils in their lunch. Three, interpersonal teacher bias in the form of subjective intolerance and cultural bias in the form of hyper visibility of black males in an educational setting where their very identity is seen as not compatible with the educational setting. So, in an effort to study and contribute something that will strengthen rather than further pathologize African-American males. I sought out effective teachers. Teachers who work with some of the lowest performing, in some of the lowest performing schools and have high concentration of black males in their classrooms, whose educational backgrounds are riddled with inconsistent leadership, inexperienced teaching, 
and under-resourced schooling. I studied how these teachers make a commitment to educate all of their students, not by striving to be colorblind, but by off and not by offering special treatment and allowances to their black students, but rather by one courageously taking responsibility for all their students' learning, by committing to reflect emotionally on challenges in their classroom and integrating a social emotional understanding of their students and other teachers' behavior, and by being fundamentally committed to equity and social justice for their students. Not because they're disadvantaged, but because they see all their students as having the brilliance and capacity to achieve excellence. These three commitments, a courageous commitment, an emotional commitment, and a commitment to social justice are just one of 15 other significant findings that will contribute to the equitable transformation of education in California through this program. Yesterday was the anniversary of the landmark ruling of Brown versus Board of Education, reminding us that the history in education in America is fraught with inequalities. Glory Lassen Billings refers to it as an educational debt that America owes to its students of color. As graduates in the program, we are not only responsible for upholding the values of those that came before us, those that fought for a more just and equitable schooling for all children, but we seek to innovate and transform, creating powerful schools that nurture and support all children to be college and career ready, and as well as be prepared to engage their communities in transformative ways. Our doctorate in education is a practitioner scholar degree. We are in this program because we are practicing educators. The intention of our research is to produce change that improves educational outcomes for all children and young adults. Look at my two sons. They are beautiful, creative, empowered, powerful young black males. Elijah and Cameron, you inspire my research. And I stand here today because I made a decision several years ago that they would see me walk across this stage as Dr. Macheo Payne slash daddy. And there are many faces behind all of our research, my cohort mates. The face of migrant students struggling to retain precious credits while their families move seasonally to make a living. The face of students with special needs, being over-identified as special ed and under-resourced to achieve. The face of first-generation college students, succeeding more when their programs reflect their history and their identity, and when counselors care enough to offer authentic support for their educational success. The face of community college applicants that somehow never make it to registration, Tomorrow is the birthday of Malcolm X, a leader who fearlessly and courageously fought for civil rights, the very same civil rights that this program was designed to protect in the students in California. And so we stand here between two significant dates in American history, looking back to a legacy of injustice and disenfranchisement, while looking forward to ways in which we will lead education in California for generations to come. So to quote Malcolm X, education is the passport to the future. Tomorrow belongs to those who prepare for it today. So Rama, Leo, Damien, Lisa, Rick, Jeff, Tara, Blanca, Julissa, Andrea, Katie, AJ, and Jackie, we've been prepared. We've been well prepared. And we've been given the passport to the future. So with that, I want to thank you, my classmates, and thank you 
to San Francisco State's doctoral and education program leadership, faculty, and staff, and thank you to each and every person here who has supported someone sitting right over here for the past three years and beyond. And thank you to everyone for being here to witness and participate in not only the successful culmination and soon to be culmination of this doctoral program for 15 of us up here, but the renewal of hope and equitable change in California's educational system. Thank you. to introduce to you Ms. Leo Adediji, our distinguished student for the 2013 Educational Doctoral Cohort. Ms. Adediji holds a Bachelor of Arts degree in Sociology and African American Studies from the University of California, Davis, and a Master's degree in Sociology from Humboldt State University. As advising coordinator at San Jose State University, Ms. Adeliji's dissertation research focuses on the academic support systems <coughs> for transfer students, especially first-generation college students and ethnic minorities. She has observed firsthand how these students have historically underperformed academically compared with their peers, and wondered how well the university's academic support systems were serving these students' unique situations. In response, she developed and implemented a survey of all junior transfer students at San Jose State during one year, measuring their academic behaviors and perceptions of the university's academic support services. She also paired these data with the students' academic records to gauge the associations among such behaviors, perceptions, and academic performances. Her findings confirm that first-generation college students and minority students have different academic habits and supports than their peers, and the academic support services that meet the needs of many students miss their potential impact with first-generation and minority transfer students. Ms. Adediji's dissertation shows how applied research can inform and affect educational services to better serve a large proportion of San Jose State's transfer students and improve their academic achievement. Please welcome Ms. Leo Adeniji. Friends and family, as we've gone through this time over the past few years, I just want to say thank you Thank you, thank you for everyone who has been there for me, for my cohort members, and who have helped to make this program stand as a viable and truly effective program. Thank you very much. <laughs> there is, of course, a very key person uh, up here on the podium, and that is Dr. Robert Gabriner. <laughs> he is the director of the uh, Educational Doctorate in Leadership for San Francisco State University. And um, I am happy now to introduce him uh, for the pudding ceremony uh, for our graduates. Dr. Gabriner. Take a few minutes until we get everybody organized. <laughs>
Before we, uh, before we start this uh, final part of the program, I think it's important to make a few remarks um, about folks who have made this all possible. Um, you know a lot about your students who are graduating. You probably know much less about the work that the faculty did in support of those students. But those faculty who are up here are people who are workhorses who work closely uh, day in and day out with the students, uh, critiquing, holding their hands, coaxing them, uh, reflecting with them. These folks are um, critical to this whole process, and I want us to give them a hand. And standing behind and besides the faculty is a small staff that works with me. These are folks that make the things happen. And they also need to be recognized. And so they are Marina Badway. And Charlotte Neff. wonderful student assistant, Noah Hall. Okay. Now this is the time and the place for us to place the doctoral hood on the shoulders of our 2013 candidates. As I call your name, will you and your chair come forward? Dr. Lyell Adediji. Dr. Adediji's dissertation is Transfer Students' Perceptions of Factors Supporting University Success. Her chair is Dr. Sheldon Jen, who will be doing the hooding. Lael is receiving the first of a series of gifts to, the, uh, to this graduating class. It is a... Um, we expect them to carry it everywhere with them. Dr. Jeffrey D. Alves. Social Science Classrooms, Differences Across the Divide. His chair is Dr. Patricia Irvine, who will be doing the hooding. Blanca E. Artiega. <laughs> is, it's about being genuine and having heart. Latinos perspectives of college counseling. Her chair is Dr. Graciela Orozco, who will be doing the hooding. Katrina A. Bell. Today's dissertation is Similar Goals and Dueling Agendas, Perceptions of Campus Internationalization and Equity Policies. 
Dr. Patricia Irvine will be uh, doing the hooding in place of Dr. Ronald Purser, her chair. And I also, also think is going to be presenting her dissertation findings in a, a symposium in Germany this summer. Dr. Lisa Everett. Lisa's, Lisa's dissertation is Re-envisioning Professional Development, a Case Study of a California Community College. And I'm proud to say that I'm the dissertation chair and I will be doing the hoodie. Jackie Vo Feldinger. Dissertation is examining the effects of district size on the opportunity gap. Her chair is Dr. Jeannie Stowers, who will be doing the hoodie. C. Goldfein. <laughs> and the of community college STEM bridge programs, planting seeds for replication. Her chair, that's me again, but it's Dr. Norena Badway who will be doing the hooding. Mama's title of her dissertation is Countering Oppression, Examining Metro's Model of Social Justice Education. Her chair is Dr. David Hemphill, who will be doing the play. She's one happy student. Lisa Mendoza Gonzalez. <laughs> Lisa's dissertation is Harvesting Hope Through La Corrida, the experiences of mobile migrant high school students. Her chair is Dr. Ali Bokian, who will be doing the hoodie. Mateo Payne. Mateo's presentation is entitled The Three Commitments Critical Race I'm sorry, The Three Commitments Critical Race Theory and Disport, Dis, Disproportionate Suspension of Black Males. <laughs> His chair is Dr. Sean Ginwright who will be doing the hooding. but do not enroll. I'm the chair. I'm going to do the hoodie.
look good. <laughs> Dr. Damian Robinson. Hope and Hopelessness in Middle School Students of Color. He's not here today, and I'm going to be doing the hooding instead. And I want to add that Damian was the youngest member of any cohort to graduate. as identified by suburban students of color. Her chair was also Jeff Duncan Andrade, who still is not here. <laughs> and I'm going to do the hood. A.J. Winkler. Her chair is Dr. Jean Stowers, who will be doing the hooding. Give them all a hand. Wait, wait for the music. <laughs> 